I echo Steve, it is great to see you all. We have a pretty good um, group of folks given that this is an hour earlier than uh, last week. Um, also, as you all know, I think really well, uh, next Sunday we will not Zoom or do anything at this hour. We will do, uh, we'll return to what uh, our normal Sunday morning schedule would be next Sunday in person at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. We will Zoom only at 10.30 next Sunday. Um, and I mean, we'll Zoom at 10.30 as well as do in person. So um, that will be an adventure for all of us. Um, and I welcome your input, whether you're Zooming or in person next week about what is working and what isn't. Um, we will have communion next Sunday at 8.30, but not at 10.30. So if, if, it, it is, uh, if you can't do without communion next Sunday, come at uh, 8.30. Remember, we still have the same guidelines in place that we did before we stopped in-person worship. So next Sunday, everyone that is here at church will have a mask on. Um, I will have a mask on. And um, the lectors, uh, lambs, everybody has to have has to have masks, and we still have six feet of uh, distancing that we're doing. So while we're certainly, I hope, out of the woods in terms of the virus, we still are uh, practicing safe safe uh, safe practices. Um, Palm Sunday, I wanted to let you know uh, we also will try to be outside if the weather permits before the service begins and wave palms and move around a little bit and do a kind of a procession into worship at both services with trying to keep each other spaced out if we can, not if the weather permits. And if we can worship outside and then, you know, when, when it looks like we've got some regularity and dependability about the warmth, um, we'll go outside, but who knows exactly when when, when that will be, I don't know. I will ask you all at the end of this service, uh, when we start into coffee hour, I will ask you um, on Easter Sunday about your preference. Uh, for those of you who may not be ready to be back at church physically, do you want to Zoom at the nine o'clock service or the 11 o'clock? On Easter Sunday, our two service times will be nine and 11. We did that in case we need to add an early service at 7.30. Um, but I want, we're only going to Zoom one time for one service, so I'd love your preferences as to whether that's 9 or 11 on Easter. Does that make sense? Um, all right. All right. And uh, you can see, I think, in the announcements in the bulletin, the other services coming up and what we hope to do. Um, Maundy Thursday, we'll have an agape meal, which I don't know if we've done before at All Saints, uh, but I think that'll be meaningful and we'll do it in place. We're only Zooming. You can do that at home. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in successive Sundays and in emails. <sighs> Let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness.
Blessed be the, the God of our salvation. Who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. The Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Right. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread, which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us, and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent a poisonous serpent among the people, and they bit people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the serpents from us. So Moses prayed to the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous, poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it up on a pole, and whenever the serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from Psalm 107. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took to rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts, shouts of joy. I picked this day for my swan song as elective. I'm trying to hold it. Because this, because the um, second reading is St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Sin has graciously allowed me to explain. It turns out that Cindy and I have something in common. We have both visited Ephesus, and we were both blown away by the experience. Ephesus' heyday was over 2,000 years ago. It is beautiful. A broad avenue splits the city. On one side were communal toilets with running water 2,000 years ago. On the other side is a huge, beautiful library which Cindy particularly loved. There is an amphitheater, which could have been the model for the Hollywood Bowl. I walked up the stairs of the amphitheater and sat down. That's when I was struck by a God moment. I was sitting where an Ephesian sat, listening as a city leader read a letter to the city that had been received from Paul a follower of Jesus Christ. As a lector here and in New Jersey, before we moved here, I had many times read one of Paul's letters. On that day, sitting in that spot as a Christian, I was moved to tears. Now, with your permission, I'm gonna sit back, ask Maureen to read the letter while I close my eyes and pretend I'm sitting in that amphitheater on that beautiful day. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. 
following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Okay, mute us. O Lord, grow us as children of light. Amen. Years ago, I remember it like it could have been last night. I dreamt repeatedly of a snake that was trying to bite my heels. And I was so afraid of it, fearing that it was going to hurt me, that I just ran from it. And still, it would pursue me relentlessly. And it lunged at the back of my feet. I can see it now. And yet, if it ever struck me, I didn't feel it. And looking back at those vivid memories, I realized that snake never harmed me. Not once. In recalling the stories with the spiritual director, she suggested that if the dream ever occurred again, to ask the snake, do you have a gift to give me? And I wonder if that is what was really going on in that dream. And I was too afraid to even imagine that the snake might have been a good thing. Maybe it was chasing me to encourage me to move in a new direction. I was moving, I'll tell you. Maybe it was encouraging me to go with a new purpose. I was stuck in fear, though I only saw danger and something harmful. And in a way, I think that's exactly where the children of Israel might have been. They've been freed from enslavement. They're wandering, though, in a wilderness that they are afraid is going to last forever. And in Numbers, as John just read so brilliantly, they're discovering that freedom and new adventures calls for new skill sets. And they are afraid. They may re be regressing a bit and notice that they start blaming their trouble all on Moses and God. Why have you brought us here to, to die? And I love it. They have no trouble saying what they think. We detest this miserable food. This liberty business is tougher than they expected. And then enter the poisonous snakes. 
I will confess to you the assertion that God sent them, I find a bit troubling. To what extent was this the mindset of the faithful in that time period? And to what extent was it the action of God? I find this a realm of mystery. And at the same time, I respect that the text is saying this was God's doing. However it came about, the serpent crisis brings the people to a higher level of functioning because their very next words are, we have sinned. They have started taking responsibility for their own actions, and they confess at the same time their utter dependence upon God. The, the Lord transformed their instrument of deepest pain into a vessel of healing, that serpent on a pole at which they could look at and live. I think this may be a core challenge in all of our faith journeys, especially in wildernesses like pandemics. How to increase our capacities to build strengths and new paths to oases, how to take responsibility for ourselves in new ways because of new challenges, and at the same time, rest in and depend on and own that we are utterly dependent on the God who made us and loves us and this world so deeply. At times, this means we've got new questions to deal with. It means taking hold of new truths as they become clear and embracing new challenges, whether we liked them or not, and new hopes that God has placed before us. A university president a few years ago at the opening of a major seminar his school was hosting on environmental issues observed that I'm paraphrasing him the climate change and creation concerns were fantastic opportunities disguised as intractable problems. I love his way of thinking. It's so open armed and expectant. Nicodemus, a Jewish leader in Pharisees in Jesus day, clothed himself in the disguise of night as he approached Jesus just before we come to today's gospel. And he says something incredibly remarkable. Rabbi, speaking to Jesus, we know that you are a teacher sent from God for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. This is the Pharisee, a Jewish leader telling Jesus that he shoots the truth straight up. He can speak to the light that he sees in Jesus, and he has a lot to lose, which is why he's doing it in the disguise of night. Just just soon after he and Jesus have this conversation. Anyone of Jewish faith who declares that their belief in Jesus as the Son of God can be, can be kicked out of a synagogue. And Jesus tells him something that Nicodemus just doesn't get. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from above, water and spirit. And Nicodemus asks, how can anyone be born from above? And Jesus answers him in the words that we see in today's gospel. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then Jesus goes on with the words we know so well. Jesus has become the serpent who through his own death brings life. Nicodemus may well have left Jesus' presence that night with more questions than he had answers, but he stays close enough to Jesus in the days to come to become a follower of his. And I wonder if our Lord may be encouraging us to embrace our times and places of uncertainty where we have more questions or fears than clarity and just trust that if we stay open to God's direction, we will come upon new life. We can master, perhaps, the courage day by day to come out of any darkness about what we believe and what we see and name happening in this beautiful and broken world and follow Holy Spirit's light wherever it may take us. In that literal spirit, Holy Spirit, I decided I want to explore what snakes might represent in our dreams, that realm of experience notice we can't control, at least not completely. And I wanted to see, well, what have I missed? This book by Tony Crisp is called Do You Dream? It was recommended to me by a spiritual director. He has remarkable things to say about snakes. See if any of these speak to you. The divine energy or life force in human beings, which realizes and releases some of its potentials, 
also a symbol of inner wisdom or knowledge of life's secret processes and of healing as used by the medical profession. Roshin could tell us more. A lot of you could about that. As the power of energy that lies behind all life, it can express in many ways, like a plant that can express further and further potentials if allowed to grow and develop in the right way. It symbolizes the possibility of expanded consciousness or awareness of the eternal nature and life in God. Christ is sometimes depicted as a crucified servant, exactly so in today's gospel. He goes on, the snake represents the energy, basically an evolutionary energy moving back to spiritual consciousness. From pure consciousness, it creates individuality, then expands the awareness of individuality until it is aware of the whole. Thus, the snake is different to the dove or the sun, S-U-N, which is spirit energy in its descending aspect rather than evolving as an individual. The snake reaches up to the sun and the two blend. Isn't that incredible? Jesus is the nexus, the meeting point of the evolutionary energy of creation that rises and the descending energy of the spirit. And Jesus meets us in that place of sacred and human and, and, and life forms of energy and meets us, God meets us in that nexus in Jesus and his son and sent his son not to condemn the world, but to save it and to save us. I love David Lowe's reflections on that kind of love. He says, this, uh, the kind of self-sacrificing love Jesus offers is frightening to our world. No matter how hard we try, what position we may achieve, how much money we may save, we cannot secure our destiny or save our lives. Only God can do that. Only love can do that. And it's frightening to be so utterly dependent on God. Then he goes on. In the face of unconditional love, we are powerless. We can choose to accept it or not. Maybe we can run away from it, but we cannot influence it, manipulate it, or control it. In the face of that kind of love, we are powerless. God's love, you see, is tenacious. And so God's love will continue to chase after us like that relentless snake and hold on to us and redeem us all the days of our lives, whether we like it or not. If we can remember and cherish God's tenacious love, we might realize, and I love this, precisely because this is the one relationship in our lives over which we have no power. It is the one relationship we cannot screw up. Isn't that fabulous? Because God created it. God maintains it. And God will bring it to a good end all through God's vulnerable, sacrificial, and tenacious love. My friends, we cannot ultimately screw that up. That is what this journey is all about. Thanks be to God for this unspeakable love and gift. Amen. Prayers of the people. Embraced by God's word, let us intercede for all those in need, saying, Have mercy, Amen. Lord. For the church, that our Lenten hunger may be for justice, and our thirst for deeds of justice, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For the church, that all those to be baptized at Easter may see through the dazzling attractions of sin and rejoice only in God's marvelous gift, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For the community of nations, that the worth of every life may compel us on the way to solidarity and peace, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For exiles and refugees, that all who are homeless because of war or hunger, because of the greed or hatred of others, because of disabilities, may find places of rest and kindness, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. 
for those who struggle with addictions, that they may find strength and love for the simple gifts of God, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For this assembly, God's handiwork, that our steps be directed in ways of peace that lead us to the side of those the world despises, and that we name these rejected ones our brothers and sisters, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. For those who are sick or in need of our prayers, including Harry, Barbara, George, Beth, Scott, Rob, Carol and Gary, Jody, Lynn, Tatum, Tom, Kiki, Kevin and Mary Jo and family, Kathy, Linda, Sean, Aaron, Adelaide and Lillian, Bill, Dick and Holly, Ted, Grady, Bonnie, Norman, and Joe and Mary Ann, Dick and Miriam, Dan, Ed and Carol, Marsha, Shirley and Charlie, Jeannie, Glenn, Anthony, and Pat. Have mercy, O Lord. For our armed forces and those in harm's way, our enemies and those who wish us harm, and the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. For our companions in ministry, for Robert Bishop. For Michael, our presiding bishop. Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury. Pope Francis in Rome. Iglesia Anglicana of Chile. Keith and the lay people of Emmanuel Lutheran. From our diocese, Daniel at Christ Church in Elizabeth City, and all who minister in our church, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. We pray for those celebrating another year of life. Martha Spar, John Tucker, Mary Ann DeYoung, Charles Coppage, and Demetrius Vlahos, we pray. Have mercy, O Lord. We give thanks for the life of Dolores, Sophie Avent's mother, for Melanie, Pat Kinney's nephew's wife, and for Linda Ragusa, Deb Hutton's sister-in-law. And we offer prayers for the repose of their souls and prayers of comfort for their families and friends. We pray. Have mercy, O Lord. God, full of goodness and open to weakness, Remember all whom we remember and remind us of all whom we would forget. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of, God of all mercy. mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Amen. All right, dear friends, could you please, if you're willing, unmute yourselves. can't miss this. We can't miss this. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And God's Amen. people say, Amen. 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 Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace. Happy birthday, Charles. Actually, actually, uh, it's my it's my daughter's birthday. Oh, good to know. Good to know, uh, my friend. Her name is Mary Charles, and we call her Charlie. So okay, thank you. 
All right, dear friends, and Maureen and John, you could stay muted in this part. We're, we're good to go. Friends, let us pray as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then communion is just around the corner, but until we are celebrating it together, let us pray. In union, O Lord, with the faithful of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. We present to you our souls and bodies with the earnest wish that we may always be united to you. And since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves with you and embrace you with all the love of our souls. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live in you and may you live in us, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Look down in mercy, Lord, on your people who worship before you and grant that those whom you have nourished by your word and spiritual sacraments may bring forth fruit worthy of repentance through Christ our Lord. Amen. Life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.